In this podcast, I'm going to address our last two required works, three really when we include the stained glass window from Chartres, but I'll combine this with a review of some of the vast history that we've been dashing through. This unit covers almost a millennium. The first Christian Roman Emperor Constantine erected his arch in 315 CE. Our last work, the Rocca and Pietà, dates from 1300 to 1325, or approximately 1,000 years later. Whew. Two of the big college board learning objectives restated in plain English are to understand how art changes over time and to recognize influences across cultures and time periods. In this lecture, I'm going to talk about both of these themes as I look at depictions of Christ and Mary, picking up our last three works in the process. <clears throat> If we have to cover a thousand years in one unit, at least this unit offers a common content, the narrative symbols, sacred spaces, and liturgies of the Christian church. But these too have evolved and been interpreted differently over time. Let me start by talking about how depictions of the central figure in the Christian narrative, Jesus Christ, evolved over the period we're covering in this unit. But first, I want to offer a caution. The Christ of the New Testament and of our Christian faith is a complex, multifaceted individual, teacher, miracle worker, prophet, savior, son of man, and son of God. So when I talk about changing depictions of Christ, I'm talking about changes in the emphasis different eras place on different aspects of this character and ministry. Two common early images of Christ are Christ as the Good Shepherd, which you see here, sort of, in the Catacomb of Priscilla. I've included two other rather clearer Catacomb Good Shepherd images. You'll note the similarities. Here's a Good Shepherd mosaic from the Western Roman capital of Ravenna. Note that this dates from pre-Justinian Ravenna, so it would probably still be labeled as early Christian, not Byzantine art. We still see a number of Roman influences. The artist chose to depict a landscape, and he uses shading to create figures with actual volume. Of course, the ropes look classical as well. Early Christian art also frequently depicted Christ as a philosopher and a teacher. Note that both Christ the Good Shepherd and Christ the Philosopher are images of Jesus as a young man. It's easy to see how the role of teacher-philosopher would fit into a late classical culture that deeply admired Socrates, Plato, and Aristotle. Shepherds, likewise, were familiar figures in the classical world, and Christ's role as a nurturing shepherd would have been an attractive image for evangelizing or attracting new believers to this new and still persecuted religion. The more powerful but also more disturbing image of Christ crucified, which will become so prominent in later Christian art, is almost unknown in this period, but this image from the church doors of Santa Sabina is an intriguing exception. <coughs> Sorry. This apse mosaic from San Vitale illustrates the transition from early Christian to Byzantine depictions of Christ. Christ is still youthful and beardless in this mosaic, but this is nevertheless Christ as ruler of the world, symbolized by the orb he is sitting on. He's handing a martyr's crown to San Vitale, while Bishop Eusebius is handing a model of the church to Christ. The changes in imagery reflect some very important religious and political changes. Christianity is now the official religion of an empire that unites the power of the church and the power of the state. This is Justinian's church, even though he never actually set foot in it, and he has clearly associated the power of Christ with the power of his empire. Note, too, that the blue sky of the Good Shepherd mosaic has been replaced by the golden sky typical of Byzantine mosaics. The Byzantine church placed, and Orthodox churches still place, great emphasis on the spiritual, otherworldly nature of God and Christ. Byzantine art is more abstract, more symbolic, and less naturalistic than early Christian art, <clears throat> or for that matter, Gothic Christian art. It is also more imperial, which accounts in part for the lavish use of expensive materials. So what do we know about this image from the date? Well, the mosaic was created after the iconoclastic battles of the 8th and 9th centuries when Hagia Sophia's earlier mosaics were destroyed. Christ Pantocrator means Christ Lord of Hosts or ruler of the world, and it is probably the most common image of Christ in later Byzantine art. 
Almost every Byzantine church had some variation of this image, which associated Christ with rulership and therefore, of course, with empire. Other distinctly Byzantine features in this image include the highly frontal pose, the long, thin nose and almond-shaped eyes, the very heavy reliance on line to establish strong contours, and the stylized, flat, unmodeled features of the clothing and body. On to Romanesque. And one way in which this tympanum sculpture signals the dawn of the Romanesque era is that Christ is carved in stone. Monumental stone sculpture has returned to European art after more than 500 years. No depiction of Christ is more iconic of Romanesque art than Christ as the final judge of all human beings. Here we see him sitting on what may be a sea of glass before his throne. The sea of glass is mentioned in the book of Revelation. The throne designates power, but this is spiritual power over salvation and damnation, not the imperial temporal power of the Byzantines. We looked at this last judgment scene from Chartres' West Portal in our last class. While we identified some changes from the Romanesque tympanum at Sainte-Foy, more focus on Christ's majesty, less focus on the perils of hell, it's important to remember that this is a portion of Chartres that survived the fire of 1194. In other words, it dates from the late Romanesque cathedral that was remodeled into an early Gothic cathedral after the fire. Now, the College Board identifier calls this a work of Gothic Europe, and that's how you should identify it if asked. But here we see the south portal of Chartres, not a required work. It was carved just a hundred years later, but this made it the heart of the Gothic period. And here again, we see a last judgment, but note that this clearly Gothic tympanum is carved in higher relief and that the figures interact with each other. Both of these are characteristic of Gothic sculpture. So let's move away from sculpture and consider the famous Gothic stained glass of Chartres Cathedral. Here's a nativity scene. Here is Christ's presentation at the temple. And here is Christ's entry into Jerusalem. None of these is a required image, although Chartres Cathedral is, of course, overall a required work. Of the 29 images in the Bay of Windows depicting the life of Christ, an astonishing 20 depict his birth, his infancy or his childhood. And this tells us something important about the Gothic era. This is the great age of Christian humanism, and Chartres Christ, at least the one who appears in stained glass, was once a helpless baby and was once a young child. This is also an age when the adoration of Mary assumes central importance in the Christian faith, and we'll get there in a moment. But first, finally, we get to one of today's required works, in the Chartres panel, we saw images of Christ that revealed more of his humanity, but nothing like the emotional horror of this dramatic work, which has the latest date of all the required images for this unit. <clears throat> Crucifixions were entering into the Christian art during the Gothic period, but the crucified Christ was generally portrayed as a triumphant figure who was overcoming death, not as a man suffering a painful execution. You can see this more triumphalist portrayal in the Italian High Gothic crucifixion I've placed on the right. But the Rocca in Pietà presents the crucifixion in all of its pain and terror. It also presents Christ's mother, not as the serene mother of God, or the queen of heaven, or the throne of wisdom, or the tender loving Madonna, but as a woman in agony over the loss of her son. So what's going on here? What's changed? Well, both the Romanesque and Gothic eras were rather upbeat periods in history. <clears throat> Roman churches celebrated, among other things, the realization that the world did not come to an end in the year 1000. The food supply and population were growing, towns were re-emerging, and a self-confident Christendom even set off in crusades, admittedly not the church's finest hour. Gothic Europe saw the rise of cities, the establishment of great universities, and a Christian humanism that celebrated learning and human accomplishment, although always with a Christian perspective. 
Faith became more triumphant, but also more comforting. Again, stay tuned for the new role that Mary was playing in Christianity. The 1300s or the 14th century were another matter altogether. Europe was hit by a terrible new wave of bubonic plague, which killed a third of Europe's population, perhaps 20 million people altogether. The Hundred Years' War between France and England devastated much of France. The church experienced its Babylonian captivity with rival popes in Avignon and Rome. The Ottoman Turks conquered much of Eastern Europe and advanced on Vienna. Finally, this was a century of terrible climate change, in this case, global cooling, or it is sometimes known as the Little Ice Age, and widespread famine developed as farms became dramatically less productive. The church and individual Christians responded to this suffering in various ways. The 14th century witnessed a rise of mysticism and a great emphasis on personal devotion. If High Gothic Christendom identified with Christ the innocent babe, Christ the ruler, and Christ the son of Mary, late Gothic Christ identified with late Gothic Christianity identified with Christ the suffering servant who had experienced our troubles and could help lead us through them. These were the years when Francis of Assisi transformed monasticism by sending monks back to the cities to minister to the poor, and the suffering of Christ and his empathy for suffering humans was central to the Franciscans' very popular preaching. The focus on Christ's humanity and suffering resonated especially strongly in Germany, where intellectual High Gothic humanism had never taken quite as strong a hold anyway. We will see more of these tormented Christs in the art of the Northern Renaissance after Christmas. The term Expressionism will return in the 20th century and again will be used especially to describe German works, so stay tuned. What stylistic devices does the artist use to convey emotion in this work? Well, the paint is faded now, but the torrent of blood would have been a vibrant, dramatic red. The lines of the sculpture are twisted and contorted. The scale is not realistic. Mary is much larger than Christ, perhaps signaling the way Christ is temporarily diminished in death. And I'm going to break here and continue in a second podcast just so that I don't choke you 